Welcome back to Bespoke Addict. Um, the last video ended rather, rather abruptly. Um, I'm, I'm working in the salon and um, I could see somebody coming in at the corner of my eye. Somebody came in obviously, so I ended it rather abruptly. But I watched the video back and I made a couple of errors. Um, I suggested that these shoes were made for Peter Kaplan. That name's wrong, his name was Sir Peter Rawley. Kaplan's his wife's name, Betty, Betty Kaplan. Um, it's Betty that sold the shoes. And they were, they were a gift from uh, Richard Dreyfus. Um, beautiful things. And they've had a bit of time to sort of dry up. They're still a little bit damp, having wiped them over with alcohol, but it does tend to dry quite quickly. So, um, yeah, they're just wonderful little things. The data did 1991. Yeah, they are. Um, let's have a look. November 1991. Uh, just fabulous. Um, yeah. Oh, I do, do, do need to clarify. As I mentioned that in the previous film, Peter was a he was a he was a producer and an agent, a Hollywood producer and agent, which is true. I think I also said his wife Betty Kaplan was also a producer. She's not a producer. She was a, a director. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what I wanted to look at a bit more closely, I did mention I was going to remove that stitch because that was wrong. This one's original. It's okay. You now it's cleaned. It looks fine. So I've taken that stitch out. Um, but when I was taking that stitch out, I noticed that the tongue was incorrect. The tongue had slipped and it had been stitched through at the bottom and it, it had a, a, a wrinkle inside. The tongue is actually supposed, there's a tiny row of stitching here. There's the decorative stitching and there's a secondary row of about eight stitches. Now those stitches go through those tiny holes there in the tongue. Just hold the tongue straight and firm. So the tongue moves this side, but not the other. The other shoe, it's still fixed. Um, yeah, the tongue's still fixed here, as it should be. Um, and this one, it's become loose, it drops down, and it had slipped inside, and it had been accidentally stitched through when somebody tried to replace this anchor stitch. I think it's called an anchor stitch, but I might be wrong. But um, I will redo that stitch. I'll get the tongue out of the way, and I'll redo the stitch. It's, it's kind of a... It has like a little knot in the middle. They're not terribly difficult to do, it's fiddly, but um, I'll do it in linen and not polyester. But, um, the other thing is, these actually, on the inside, they are they have New and Lingwood's um, heel sock branding on them. These were definitely made by George Cleverly. At this time, in the early 90s, George Cleverly had sold his own company. His original, he'd retired, basically. And um, I believe it was John Conner and uh, George Glasgow Senior bought the George Cleverly, Cleverly Company. And um, before New and Lingwood um, purchased Paulson Scone, um, there's Paulson Scone on there as well. Paulson Scone got into difficulty in the late 70s. Um, was it late 70s, early 80s? I think it was, yes. And um, New and Lingwood bought Paulson Scone and George had been consulting, he'd been trying to, to help them with it. Um, help Pulse and Scone, but it went it went it went into liquidation. New and Lingwood bought the name, rather um, so that they could do their ready to wear shoes with a with a recognised um, a recognised um, name on there. Um, but there was still a demand coming through um, through New and Lingwood for Pulse and Scones bespoke, and because of George Cleverley's association um, for George himself, but. George had sold his own business and classically the classical silhouette of a George Cleverly bulges out here and the toes are quite chiselled. Now it would have been wrong of George having sold the company with the branding rights and the intellectual property to have continued to produce shoes with, admittedly with somebody else's name on but with the classical silhouette. That belonged to John Carnier and George Glasgow Jr. It had been sold. So his later output was less classically Cleverly more classically, Pools and Scone, the rounded sort of beautiful sort of almond toes really, were a, a Pools and Scone sort of shape. So that's why these don't look classically George, but all of the, all of the, everything about them, if you're familiar with George's work, you just, you just know it's George. And um, I, I also know that George was working pretty much full time at New and Lingwood at the time these were made. And um, yeah, just couldn't be happy with them. But I'm now going to just, yeah, they're dry enough to start nourishing them with the uh, Sophia cream. 
Um, yeah, I'll definitely do the tongs because the tongs are getting quite brittle and uh, just a few very minor cracks around the edges which I'm going to just nourish and hope for the best on those. If they start to get worse, I will open the stitching, lining and separate the lining and I will put, do my usual trick of putting very fine chamois leather on the back of the, of the outer skins, glue it and then re-stitch it through the original holes then trim off the chamois so that will all the strength and the integrity of the shoe will be on the chamois leather not the ancient Russian reindeer but um, <clears throat> they're not really that much to show to be honest with you on the, on the moisturising it's just a case of putting this on a cloth very carefully I'll do all the insides and get right down into the stitching and yeah the tongs are they do get quite brittle and I don't really believe these had any maintenance before they were sold I saw the photographs of them before they were sold to my Instagram friend and um, yeah he's he's they were extremely dry looking and um, I've seen some of some of um, the other Peter Rawley shoe collection I don't think he was known for for maintenance he bought bespoke shoes and enjoyed wearing them but yeah looking at the shoes they didn't really I don't think they got heavy use they just got no maintenance so um, these will need a lot and I'll start on the inside and I'll just nourish them. I'm not going to stick that on thick. I'll put it on very fine, let it absorb in. I'll keep agitating it as it absorbs. So when you're trying to put creams onto dry skin, if you put it on thick and leave it, the skin will absorb the easily absorb easily absorbable properties and leave behind the sticky residues. And it's the sticky residues that are, are the more nourishing effect. So I have to keep sort of agitating it as it goes in, wait for it to dry and I'll buff it with a dry brush, then reapply, go through the same thing. And that might take two or three weeks. I'll definitely use the remainder of this pot. It's only about a third of a pot in there. That's not enough. I'll get another one because I'll just keep nourishing and nourishing and nourishing inside and out, keep dry buffing. And I'll probably give them a very, very light sort of lick over with polish. Not so much to get a reflection because the skin's quite rough, but just to intensify the color. And, uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm so pleased with them. I really couldn't be happier. And I didn't think I'd get a second chance at a pair of Russian reindeer skins, if I'm honest with you. If these things do come to market, they're very rare. They attract a lot of attention, a lot of bids. The price goes high, far higher than what I'm prepared to pay. And, um, you know, you just I just got lucky with these, really. And um, I didn't think I'd get another chance having sold my other pair which were too big for me and I thought that was it I thought you know I, th I didn't think I'd get another pair and um, the gentleman that's let me have these he feels the same he thinks this is his one chance but you never know he might get lucky again anyway let's stop uh, let's stop gossiping and uh, I'll get on with applying this cream